um, oriented this talk. Um, we, we call this Zen practice, and when we're talking about Zen practice, we're talking about um, really opening ourselves in, and uh, pointing toward being completely present in this moment. This is our life. This is the one moment we've got, right? Um, Zen arose in a very old uh, Buddhist tradition. And so there are a lot of different kinds of teachings. And tonight I'm going to talk about uh, the third of the four foundations of mindfulness. And the mindfulness teachings go back um, to the early, the early teachings of the Buddha and actually, even before that, to the Vedantic teachings. Um, but the Buddha really amplified them. Uh, how many people here are familiar with the Four Foundations of Mindfulness teaching? It's something that I bring up a lot because it's very useful. Uh, it is a method of inquiring into our experience. Usually, we just take our experience at face value. Um, but there's a lot going on in any moment. There's a lot going on in any sensation or any emotion or any uh, uh, impulse. So um, the four foundations of mindfulness can take apart any mind state and look into it. When we're caught up in certain mind states that are very uh, that are, are habitual forms of suffering. Uh, the Four Foundations of Mindfulness are a really valuable tool to look into how this moment, how this experience is layered, how it's, how it's created. And of course, it is, in a certain way, this is the scientific method. It's very, very close observation. And um, as soon as we observe what's going on, we affect it, right? So that's, that's the general orientation of, of this particular teaching. And um, as in any teaching, if it's useful to you, use it. And it, if it isn't, don't worry about it. <laughs> Stay with a very, very simple practice of following the breath when you're doing your formal meditation. But the, the beauty of a life of practice we call, we call ourselves people of the way. The life of practice is, it's not just formal practice. Although formal practice gives us time to really um, simplify. You know, we're just sitting, we're just sitting, a body sitting and breathing. Very simple. And there's no way that we can't notice what the mind's doing and how incredibly complicated the mind is, and get to know ourselves better. So that's the general orientation to all of our practice. Huh? Um, so I talk about the four foundations of mindfulness that are laid out in the Satipatthana Sutra. Um, body as body, feelings as feelings, consciousness as consciousness, and mental formations as forms in the mind. Um, the, um, I emphasize this as a tool for looking more closely at, what, at whatever we're experiencing moment by moment that we identify as ourself, as self. Uh, the self that uh, it gets caught up in feelings, in emotion, in thought, in aversion or attraction, or agitation, or depression, uh, fantasies, beliefs. You may have, you may have had a, a literal uh, sampling of that just now sitting in a very quiet zendo. And we all tend to kind of specialize in our own forms of, uh, forms that our minds tend to glom onto. You know, some people are always planning. Some people are remembering. Some people are regretting or dreading, or, you know, whatever, whatever it is. It's, it's um, anything is a form in the mind. So when we talk about um, the, uh, uh, the different 
foundations of mindfulness. Body is body, meaning becoming aware in the body of whatever it is. So let's say you're, uh, you're having a lot of pain in your knee when you're doing zazen. You can actually not even think about the pain in the knee. Mainly what you think about is, how can I get rid of this pain in the knee? <laughs> or uh, you think about other things, or you feel discouraged that you're not cut out for meditation, or you know, it's not just pain in the knee. So body is body is, okay directly into the body what what is uh, what's it like look straight on into the bone into the temperature into the the viscera the muscle whatever whatever you become aware of body 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 flesh body that is Mind states, um, I just want to uh, say that mind states can become so habitual that we get so, we get so um, identified with them. So let's say, um, you know, you're identified as, uh, I, I'm, uh, my body is so stiff I can't sit, or something like that. I mean, that's, that's who you are, right? Um, <coughs> Or you get so identified with an emotion. Oh, I'm so depressed. I'm always so depressed. Or I'm really an anxious person. Or I'm really an angry person. So that becomes your identity. And um, and you, um, it, it, this identity installs itself in every moment of your experience. It just generalizes, right? So how is this? So we begin with, okay, let's say, what about depression? Well, what is that in the body? How do you know you're depressed? What is that in the body? What is that uh, in feelings? Feelings as feelings. But, but when the Buddha was talking about feelings, he wasn't talking about, talking about emotion. He was talking about pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral. That's simple. And that's a great practice in and of itself. Pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral, or maybe a little of both, or maybe what is this neutral valence? How many moments of the day do not have a tone of pleasant, unpleasant? So this is a great practice to do. To take it a day and decide first thing in the morning, okay, today I am going to investigate pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral. Just for the for interest's sake, how does it, where is this? Because right now, check it out. You know, if you look into your experience right now, pleasant, unpleasant, neutral, mixed. So this is often misunderstood to mean emotion, but it's actually very, very specific. It's also really potent. You know, I was thinking um, about well, there are so many issues that any of us might have. Let's say we eat too much. And you start to use this, this observation, pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral, in the, in, the, uh, in the act of having a meal, and you realize, oh, actually, I wasn't, my body was not hungry. What was what was what I was doing was I was getting a little hit of pleasant from a flavor, or from a crunch, or from salty or sweet, right? So that's the kind of valence that is put into every single experience. Maybe the first ten minutes of a workout, very unpleasant. <laughs> but by the last portion, very pleasant, maybe. Um, so what I wanted to talk, concentrate on today is the third foundation of mindfulness because one, it's the very shortest in the Satipatthana Sutra. It's the least commented on. 
Uh, and it is uh, consciousness. The third foundation is awareness of consciousness. So there are three words that are used in the sutra for mind, mind consciousness, and each of them has a slightly different uh, cast to it. Uh, so the first one is um, volition, the mind as volition. So that's very interesting to look at the experience of one's will, which is a very um, ego-centered, you know, this is picking and choosing or having opinions or turning in the direction of, that's, that's the will. So that's the first uh, characteristic of consciousness mind. Um, the second is uh, recognizing and identifying that function of consciousness, which, is, which you, if you practice Vipassana, practice of noting, that's what that's all about. So, you know, if you're, if you're doing a Vipassana noting practice, you might, uh, in walking meditation, you might think lifting, foot, moving, placing, right? So that's the noting function of consciousness. Um, and then there's chitta, which is closely flavored always with, by emotion, in, as in uh, bodhicitta, the, uh, the mind of awakening, bodhi mind. Um, and this is where emotion is examined in its energetic component. We're, we're, uh, it's the atmosphere of emotion. And uh, its shape, its activity level, its energetic component. Uh, and this is why I often think of the third foundation of mindfulness as the weather front. Because we have, uh, you know, we have low pressure systems and high pressure systems, at, which is not, it's, it's immaterial, but it's discernible, and it has effect. And it has effect on all of the components of the natural, uh, what makes up the natural world. And that's true, that this is true of the fourth of the third foundation in our own <coughs> minds. There's always kind of the immaterial energetic component of any particular experience. So, um, and we can apply it to the other foundations in mindfulness too. I mean, think of pleasant. What's the energetic of pleasant? What's the energetic of unpleasant? It's discernible if you're looking, you know. Um, so when we're practicing with this foundation, we're using our Dharma eye, we're using our scientist's eye, or the phenomenological eye, about energy. And looking into, I always think of it as the energy body. Not whether I have a lot of energy or not so much energy, although that's, that's an aspect. Uh, but very, it's very specific. There are a lot of colorations of energy. Um, and they are associated with our different internal voices. Uh, that come with habitual states of mind. So this, this is a, um, this third foundation is one of the tools for discerning, discerning more specifically the characteristic of whatever the experience is at the moment. We get to know each other. Which brings me to how important it is in all of our practice to cultivate non-judgmental mind, non-judgmental mind, self-compassion, very important if we're going to investigate. Whatever we notice about ourselves is what actually is. And uh, if we feel something is unpleasant, and we're clear that it is an ingredient of our suffering, then we can bring compassion to it, kindness to it. If we're not, if we are judging what comes up, that's as far as we can go. And, um, you know, we, we have, uh, compassion is simply clear seeing. Compassion is not, um, it's not a sentiment. It's not pity. 
or anything like that. Compassion is seeing very clearly. So it's, it's closely aligned, it's one of the four divine bodies with um, uh, the uh, loving kindness, compassion, joy, sympathetic joy, taking joy in other people's happiness, and then, um, I'm blanking the word, equanimity. Equanimity. equanimity, thank you. <laughs> equanimity, which is, is open, it's not, it doesn't turn in any particular <coughs> direction, it's just what it is. Uh, neutral, it's kind of neutral. But it has a lot of consequences. Equanimity is a profoundly liberating um, quality to cultivate. It's the heart of wisdom in any way. I mean, there are a lot of hearts of wisdom, but it's one aspect. So, um, if we can bring equanimity to anything that we observe arising in ourselves, then we can stay present and open. If we bring judgment, um, we can't. That's as far as we can go in our observations. We need to protect, claim territory, protect, fend off. So I may, I may notice that the energy of my current mind state is agitation, for instance. And I notice from this, from the, this standpoint of a third foundation noticing, I can say, since I'm not going to identify with it, I'm going to identify it, I can say agitation is arising right now. Oh, I see agitation, here it is, which is a very uh, neutral and open and at ease um, approach to one's inner world. Oh, look at that. Oh, gosh. Wow, look how triggered I am. Look how, look how fearful I just got. Look how protective or outraged I, I just got, you know. You can just see it, and it really keeps the field open for uh, responses that are one, accurate, and two, really you can decide what you're going to enact there. Are you going to go into self-protection mode? Are you going to go into, you know, striking out mode? Or are you going to uh, go into listening? I mean, there are a lot of different cho choices you have when you can really bear witness to. The, uh, the character of what's coming up. So, um, being able to um, bear witness uh, loosens our hold, loosens our identification with a certain state. And we may notice um, how, when that happens, how the energy of it dissipates. So often I hear, and I have the experience of when I recognize something about what's going on emotionally for me, uh, it eases off. You know, one of, the, one of the important things about grieving is making room for the grief that comes up. I mean, you know, we might guard against grief because we're afraid it's going to swamp us. But if we actually allow ourselves to feel uh, the sadness of the passing of somebody we love, or the mystery of it, or the confusion of it, or the anger about it, or whatever, then that energy has a time to, to express and dissipate. It just naturally happens. This is the, uh, one of the three marks of existence is impermanence. Everything's impermanent. <coughs> Every form is impermanent. So, um, so looking at the, um, the different weather fronts that we that we're um, considering right now you know I, I made a list here um, energy patterns calm agitated 
smooth, rough, hesitant, rigid, dull, bright, dreamy, alert, distracted, concentrated, expansive, contracted, tight. What are some others? Manic. Manic. Shaky. Shaky. Yeah. So, so notice your own. You know. <coughs> You're anxious, and you are really working with this particular foundation, the third foundation. Uh, you can also look at what what are the energies of anxiety. You know, there's a uh, there's a holding to to anxiety. There's a pushing away to anxiety. Um, there's a fixity to it. There's an inflammation in anxiety. There's a lot of different qualities that can be observed. When you're depressed, you may first notice the lethargy or the narrative of hopelessness or, or self-criticism or uh, a dragging down feeling, a flatness or a tedium. There's a tedium when I've been depressed. There's something very tedious about that state of energy. That's a quality of suffering. Tedious. So, um, so really appreciating how our ability to uh, observe much more minutely, which takes patience and it also takes commitment. You have to be willing to, uh, to stop and take a, look, a good look. It's like we have to be willing to sit still in meditation. That can, that can take years to really fully submit to stillness. <laughs> See, first you have to be willing. You can't impose it. It's like, you know, it's, it's foolish to tell a child, just, I'm going to teach you how to meditate so your life is going to be good. <coughs> Not a good idea. Some kids really do like to sit still and be very quiet. <coughs> but a lot of kids don't. You would never force it on a child. Sometimes our inner child is like, get me out of here. Years ago, we had a, we had a um, meditation when we were still sitting down at the yoga center. One day, as one of the um, kids who came for a class assignment, we started to sit. And uh, after about two minutes, there were two of them side by side. There was a little giggling and then a little bit more giggling. You know, we're all sitting there like, mm -hmm. <laughs> And then finally they just went, ah, get me out of here! <laughs> 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 the <door. laughs> These are college oh, kids, right? Things. College kids. <laughs> college kids. Yeah. yeah. Just kids. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I make no assumptions. They may be one of you. I mean, maybe you're saying, oh, I think that was me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, um, we have to be willing to break our habits, to confront our habits, to inquire into them, and, and look into what makes them up, and not to judge. Let go of judging when it arises. That's, that is a state of mind. Judgmentalness has a feeling in my body when I'm being judgmental, or um, opinion. Now, when you have an opinion, that is a distinct, is it? I mean, do you have that experience where you have, where you have an opinion? It's like, it's really a body feeling, and it is a, it is an a state of excitation and pressure, maybe fear, you know, depending on what it, what it has to do with. But you can always, always be looking at what is the weather front that accompanies this particular moment of consciousness. Um, so Zen practice is an embodiment practice, body and mind doing the same thing. So when we do walking meditation, 
with thoroughly doing walking meditation. You can do lying down meditation. You can do standing meditation. When you're standing in the line at the supermarket, what is, what is the meditation? Well, you're not going to kind of space out. You're going to space in. You're going to listen to sound. Notice the smells. Feel the energy of the container. I mean, it's infinite. A supermarket is an infinite place. <laughs> Every place is infinite. So, um, you know, choose your, choose your focus. Um, so, I want to come back to this non-judgmental. Because I would be very sad to think that any of us are using this incredibly potent practice of presence to, to um, put more energy in our, into judgmental mind without realizing what we're doing and deepen our suffering. And that happens a lot, especially in Zen, because Zen, you know, Zen prescribes, we have this choreography, you come into a room, everything's lined up, you bow in certain ways, you, it's, it's the, the intention is to give us all something to do specifically so we don't have to make decisions. We can just surrender completely to the moment in, in its content, right? But, um, but it can bring up, uh, it can bring the inner child who just wants to do it right and doesn't know what to do. And, you know, so the... the um, the, uh, the self-judgment can really stoke up in practice. And so it's really, uh, it's, it's, it's valuable to emphasize how important there is a, uh, an attitude. There's a spirit of practice, which is very warm-hearted, very open-hearted. and recognizing how, how we judge and how we judge ourselves. And be willing to say, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to start changing that habit. And so I'll start becoming aware when it comes up. When it comes up in my body, when it comes up in my, in my you know, self-talk. So there are also, uh, we, we think about, um, you know, as this, the foundation is classically taught, it's always taught in relation to uh, the self and the immediate um, qualities of, uh, energetic qualities of mind. Um, but it's really, I think, very uh, helpful to extend it to um, wherever we are, the energies that we are subject to as we go out and about in the world. We're not just subject to our own energies. We, other people are subject to our energies, and we are. But we're also subject to others' energies, and the media's energies. So to be aware of the energy impact of various media. And you can do it as an exercise, you know, watch a movie and be aware of how you're affected by, well, the story. The story is so absorbing, you get into the story. But look at the, uh, look at the, uh, listen to the musical score and see how it affects your emotional experience. Or the, um, uh, what else? I don't know, there's just a lot, a lot in that and a lot of people watch movies and also do a lot of um, video games. Mm -hmm. I don't know if there are people here who do video games. I assume there, there are some of you who do video games. <laughs> and they definitely affect your energy body. Anything competitive, anything at all. So taking a walk. You know, why is a walk such a good antidote to depression or being in a pickle about something? It's because you change the energy and you tap earth energy and sky energy, and tree energy. <clears throat> so we, um, we talk about opening awareness. And 
And the more we practice, the more sensitive we, uh, sensitive we become to energies. Uh, probably many of you have been practicing for quite a while, and you, you, you might, if you not, if you've noticed how much more sensitive you are, how much more you notice <coughs> as you go out and about, not just about yourself, but in general. Um, so much more aware, and so much, uh, and aware of things that are outside of the senses in a certain way. I, I was uh, walking with a friend yesterday who had just returned from a trip, and the day before, he had been crossing a street, and he said he didn't even know how he knew, but there was a car speeding around the corner, and he just, he said, he just had this feeling, and he jumped. And what he did was he jumped on the hood of the car instead of getting hit by it. Wow. And that was, that was outside of his thinking. That was just pure energetic right. something that he was picking up. And he's, you know, he's been meditating a long time, and we, we just said, well, yeah, there's a good benefit. <laughs> <laughs> so, so this is all part of letting go of the self, letting go of the very uh, narrow uh, n notion of who I am, right? You realize, oh yeah, that there's a constantly, there's a, a giver and a taking and giving constantly in the energy world. They're always in complete exchange. And so becoming more and more aware and working with the third foundation um, helps us dissolve the sense of, of a limited small self. Not that we just dissolve and go, ping, and can't be seen any longer. Um, but that the energies we carry into the world are open and useful the more we are aware of our own. And, um, and instead of living with a constant self-concern that's very binding and blinding, um, caught up in our own worries and fascinations, in a way that limits how we function, we can, we can be free, we're much freer, altogether free. And free to uh, experience joy in so many different states, and also bring our warm heart into the world to function on behalf of all beings. No matter where we are, we're always bringing our own energies forward. So working this way with our own energies really does a favor to the world around us. So I hope I hope this is useful and uh, will will uh, you know, help in your practice.